Today, you are going to learn why the American dream is alive and well in Sweden. When most people think of the American dream, they think of a white picket fence, two kids, one television, a dog, and a station wagon. Not Volvo, Semlas, and ABBA. But why do these things represent the American dream? Because they're synonymous with the rise of the American middle class. Before I show why the American dream is alive in Sweden, let's first go back in time for a moment. In June 1944, the same month that American and Allied troops landed on the beaches of Normandy to begin the liberation of Europe, President Roosevelt signed the GI Bill, providing World War II veterans benefits that included payments for education and loans for starting businesses. Suddenly, millions of Americans were able to purchase homes for the very first time. The boom was manifested by urban sprawl. The world's first master plan communities, suburbia as we know it, were constructed in places like Levittown, Long Island. And this is Levittown. Here you can own your own home, complete with its own refrigerator, television set, and clothes dryer. Then came the cars. In 1954, General Motors celebrated the production of its 50 millionth car. Flint, Michigan became a middle-class boomtown and a center of industry. The Highway Act of 1956 provided $25 billion to fund vast and modern highway systems. This facilitated the transport of goods and services between industrial, commercial, and residential areas. And as the Cold War escalated with the Soviet Union, defense spending by the US government injected billions of dollars into the economy. Around that same time, the aerospace industry sprung up in my hometown of Los Angeles. Aerospace is perhaps the fastest growing industry. Testing and assembling of space equipment all take place within California's borders. There were endless, well-paid, blue-collar jobs no education needed. And this is why a home with a white picket fence, a station wagon, and a television are synonymous with the American dream. So what really is the American dream and how do we define it? It is a belief that anyone, regardless of where they were born or what class they were born into, can achieve their own version of success. The American dream is achieved through sacrifice, hard work, and risk-taking, rather than by chance. The coin was termed in a 1931 book by James Truslow Adams, titled Epic of America. Adams wrote, that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. But the idea of the American dream dates back even further to the founding of the country and to the Declaration of Independence. The founders wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The realization of the American dream was due to one simple concept, social mobility. Social mobility refers to the shift of one's social status from one status to another, the ability to climb the socioeconomic ladder. So why do you often hear that the American dream is dead or dying? And why is the American dream alive and well in Sweden? Well, before I get into that, I would just like to quickly thank you for clicking the like and subscribe button. Clicking the like button helps the YouTube algorithm show this video to more people. And by clicking subscribe, you can see more videos like this one. I have a personal goal to reach 50,000 subscribers and I'm very, very close. And I would really appreciate your support if you could click subscribe. Also, I read every single comment. So if you have anything to say or you have a question about this video, Leave it in the comment section below and I'll try my best to get back to you. So as I mentioned, many people often say that the American dream is dead or dying. And well, they're not wrong. Between 1980 and 2016, the share of income for the poorest half of the US population has steadily been declining. The share of income for the top 1% has been increasing. To put it simply, the gap between rich and poor is growing. And in Western Europe and Sweden, this just isn't the case. It's really sad to think that a child's future should be dictated by their parents' status and wealth. And sadly, this is becoming increasingly true in the United States. But as we'll see, this isn't the case in Sweden. Let me show it visually. Let's divide the population of the United States into five groups of equal size, or quintiles as they're called. In a fictitious equal society, each group would get a fifth of the income, or 20% of the income. But in reality, the income distribution in the US looks like this. The bottom quintile, the poorest quintile, receives 3% of the income. And the top quintile, the top richest 20% of people, receive 52% of the income. The problem is that alongside increased inequality, we've seen diminished levels of upward mobility in recent years. A child born in the top 20% has about a two in three chance of staying at or near the top. A child born into the bottom 
has a less than one in 20 shot at making it to the top. He's 10 times likelier to stay where he is. And in Sweden, it looks like this. The top quintile has 37% of the income and the bottom quintile receives 8% of the income. Keep in mind that this is for income and not wealth. They're two very different concepts. And as I explained in the economics of Sweden video, the Gini wealth coefficient for Sweden is actually pretty high. And you can watch that video by clicking this link up here. So we now know that the American dream is essentially the opportunity for social mobility. So let's take a look at the Global Social Mobility Index published by the World Economic Forum. In countries with high social mobility, people that are born into the lowest or the poorest quintile have a better chance of climbing the socioeconomic ladder into higher quintiles. For example, the ability of a child born into the poorest quintile to work hard and throughout their lifetime move up into one of the higher quintiles. So looking at this report, the higher the index ranking, the better the chance for mobility. Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Sweden round out the top four. Denmark is the most egalitarian society in the world. Sweden is fourth. And the United States, well, it's way down in the 27th spot. Perhaps the name the Danish dream is more fitting than the American dream. In theory, let's say two identical children with equal capability are born into low-income families in Denmark and the United States. They both work hard to achieve their dream. The child in Denmark has much higher odds to move up the socioeconomic ladder. In Denmark, it would only take an average of two generations for someone born into a low-income family to approach the mean income. In Sweden, three generations. In the USA, five generations. And in places like Brazil and South Africa, nine generations. So why should we care about any of this anyway? Well, first and foremost, I think we can all agree that fighting for a fair and just society where everyone is given an equal chance is just the right thing to do. Our parents' wealth and status shouldn't dictate our ability to achieve our dreams. But aside from that, low social mobility and the loss of the American dream is quite literally tearing the United States apart. Low social mobility has damaging consequences on the United States and is weakening the social fabric. When people are disfranchised and disheartened, there's a loss of dignity. There's an erosion of trust with government and institutions. Social unrest becomes more frequent. Inequality has been exacerbated by the nationwide lockdowns that have brought the economy to a standstill. We haven't seen the V-shaped recovery that everyone was hoping for, where the GDP dips but quickly recovers. But rather, we're seeing a K-shaped recovery. Tech companies and the stock market are booming, while mom and pop's businesses are going out of business. And then there's the opportunity cost for low social mobility. It's estimated that if each country increased its mobility index score by just 10 points, it could result in an extra $5.1 trillion in GDP growth for the global economy by 2030. I don't have all the answers for how the US can decrease the gap between the rich and the poor. And both political parties have differing ideas on how to achieve this. But I really do think that the United States can learn from Sweden and its Nordic neighbors like Norway, Denmark, and Finland. Ranked side by side, Sweden does a much better job at providing opportunities for all of its citizens. For example, access to healthcare. And I did a whole video on USA healthcare versus Swedish healthcare, which you can watch by clicking this link up here. And then there's access to education, technology, work opportunities, a fair wage, working conditions, social protection, and inclusive institutions. I really believe that the US could benefit greatly and close the gap between rich and poor by pivoting from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Currently in the USA, the system is shareholder capitalism, which says corporations have one purpose, to make as much money as possible and create value for shareholders. Whereas Nordic economies mostly adhere to stakeholder capitalism. Corporations here are oriented to serve the interests of all of their stakeholders, including customers, suppliers, employees, the environment, shareholders, and local communities. To be clear, I'm not advocating for the destruction of wealth. I think Abraham Lincoln said it best. He said, I don't believe in a law to prevent a man from getting rich. It would do more harm than good. So while we do not propose any war upon capital, we do wish to allow the humblest man an equal chance to get rich with everybody else. Thanks for watching, and I'd love to hear your ideas for how the United States can close the gap between rich and poor and restore the American middle class. Leave them in the comment section below, and I'll try to get back to every single comment.